Well, today we're talking about the end times. We're actually going to end the end times, although we could go on for a long time with the end times. There's so much information and so many things to go about. And a lot of people are wondering, what's going to happen at the end of the age? We can see what's taking place. And is there going to be an antichrist? Are we going to have uh, all these things taking place? Are we going to have people thrown in prison and punished? And what's the story with the end of the world? How is it all going to end? And the Bible says that the, the entire earth will be destroyed. And we can see all the things that are taking place right now in our world. What is God doing? I don't know if you guys are aware of what took place. And by the way, you can catch up to the series at cornerstonecheshire.com. That's our website. You can see the back, uh, the previous sermons on this. Also, you can go to Spotify and put Cornerstone Cheshire. You're going to put Cornerstone Cheshire and we'll pull up our podcast also on Apple iTunes. So you can catch up, all right? So that's what we're talking about today, the end times and what is going to happen and what are the signs that are going to happen as a result. I don't know if you guys uh, are aware. I'm not one to bring up things like this, but when you see people beginning to speak bad of you and people don't like the church, have you noticed this? As wickedness increases, godliness increases. And so um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the reason I'm bringing this up for is that because we're being marked. I don't know if you saw what happened in the Olympic opening ceremony this past week. A couple days ago, they made a mockery of Christianity made a mockery of Jesus, having transsexuals uh, depicting the Last Supper, um, all kinds of things like that. I don't even want to go into all of it, but it was pretty horrific what was happening. It looked like Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, they had transvestites dancing around with little kids, right? I mean, it was insane. The, the things that were going on there looked like something you would, you'd hear about in the Bible. And you're like, what are they doing this for? Why are they going after Christians? Do you realize if they said and they made fun of of Islam or Muhammad, there'd be right now, there'd be riots in France right now. There'd be violence. There'd be all sorts of things. They wouldn't dare do that, but they come against Christianity. Why is that? Why are there people that hate Israel that will spray the graffiti everywhere on our national monuments? Why is there this, this hatred towards the Jewish people and Christian people? Why don't other religions in the world get the same treatment? I tell you the reason why. It's not the people that are our enemy. It's the enemy that's our enemy. And he is fighting. He's against the church. Why? Because he knows his time is short. You know, when a, when a, when a lion is cornered or when a rat's cornered, it becomes more violent. And so we can see what's happening in our culture today. Now, com compared to other parts of the world, we're not experiencing a lot of persecution. But let me tell you something right now. They're marking us. They're marking us. So what are we to do as the church? Well, we're to stand up for truth. We're to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're to utilize who we are and our rights to make a difference. We're going to talk about that in a few moments, but are we in the end times? What's going to happen? We mentioned the fact it's kind of like a puzzle trying to figure out what happens next. When's the end of the age? When's the Antichrist coming? Are we going to have the mark of the beast on us? We're going to have these, these tattoos on our hands we can't buy ourselves. We're going to get into all that today a little bit and discuss what it means for you and I to be ready for the end times, we're not caught by surprise. For example, just last night, uh, if you have TiVo or you have a hard drive on your entertainment system, you can watch and you can see what happened last night. With the Yankees, for example, I'm going to ask, hey Siri, who won the Yankee game last night? The Yankees snuck past the Red Sox in 10 innings yesterday. The final score was 11 to 8. Yes! Okay, sorry. All right. Hey, perfect. Praise the Lord. Okay, so I knew they snuck past them in 10 innings. So now if I watch the game right now, it's not going to be much stress. I'm going to enjoy them getting messed up by the Yankees, thank goodness. The Yankees are having a tough time this year, but I like the fact that they won. Now that I know they won, I'm not going to be stressed out watching the game, although I'll still be involved in it. See, folks, when you understand that we win in Christ Jesus, that the best is yet to come, and all they can do is kill us. They can't kill the Spirit of God in us when you know that Christ we're going to come back and all every knee is going to bow and every tongue will confess. And so they may think they've won, but they haven't. What I mean by they is the enemy, not the people, but the spirit behind it. And so when you know that, you have, you have vigor, you have strength, and you can handle it. Well, what are some of the signs of the time? Well, the Bible says the following. Peter says the following. He says, scoffers will come 
and the last days with scoffing. What a scoffing is. Making fun of people you know, in, and saying bad things about people, scoffing and using humor and, and just kind of berating you, right? Scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, all right? They will say, where's this promise of his coming? You Christians have been talking about it forever, right? Where's the promise of his coming? Forever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of, of creation. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. Look at that as some count slowness. So many people have been saying, yeah, where's the second coming of Christ? And maybe many of you in the church are tired of hearing about it. What's the story with the second coming of Christ? You guys talk about it all the time. What's the big deal about it, right? People say things like that. Why do you guys keep on talking about it and they make fun of us? And where's the second coming? And sometimes the church can come into a couple different categories. There are those that are so preoccupied with the second coming that they think at any moment they see something happen. Oh, it's the Antichrist. And they get into these conspiracy theories, right? That it's all mind control and this is beginning to happen. You have those folks. Then you have the other folks who don't care. I, I don't even want to talk about it. I don't want to know about it. And there are those people that are just going to say, well, we're going to wait for Jesus to come back. And so we don't, we don't know what's going to happen, but why, why bother? He's going to rapture us out. That's not the attitude we're supposed to have. Jesus has us to occupy until I return. Jesus told his disciples, he said, it's not, they said, are you going to restore your kingdom? He said, it's not for you to know the days and the hours, but this is what you are to do. You are to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the othermost part of the world. I want you to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're my ambassadors. You see, the whole world needs to know about Jesus, and God is utilizing us to spread the gospel. What's the gospel? The knowledge of Jesus Christ, that everyone's going to have to face Jesus one day, and God loves you and has a purpose for your life and God's calling mechanics, God's calling doctors, God's calling school teachers and students. Wherever God's placed you, he's utilizing you to spread the good news of the gospel. That's what we're called to do, especially when we see the end coming. So the Bible says, as Peter goes on, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. And the Bible says a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Why is it taking so long? So we know now from, from scientific observation that, that time is relative. Of course, we know that from Einstein. But here the apostle Peter is saying it's 2,000 years ago before science happened. You have to understand that God's in a different zone than we are, different time zone. And so what's a minute for him might be 1,000 years for us. And so to you, it's like a long time. But for God, it's not a long time. Well, how does this all work? How does it all work? Why is God taking his chance, taking his time? Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God loves people, does not want to destroy. The fact that you're alive means that God loves people in the world and he wants people to repent. That's why he's taking his time. Now, people ask the question, what do you mean? Why is he taking so much time? Well, I happen to believe, and I think I have a good enough theology to substantiate this. This is more my opinion, which is okay to share, by the way. It comes with some sources of scripture I could show you, is I believe the Bible says a third of the angels rebelled against God. So God lost a lot of his workforce. <laughs> he lost a lot of his, what he had going on. And I believe God is doing a job interview for us. He's going to see which ones are going to fulfill the number. There seems to be some sort of numbers that have to happen. There seems to be some sort of, the Bible says, that Jerusalem will be tread under the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The Bible says this kingdom, this gospel shall be preached across the end of the world and then the end will come. There seems to be some sort of thing that has to happen first, which you're going to see in a few moments in our scriptures. So there seems to be some sort of timetable or goals that God is trying to reach. You're going to see in a few moments as I share some of the scriptures. So he's patient towards you, not wishing any to perish. Now, how many of you remember doing this when you were in fourth grade? You know what this is, right? The volcano. 
right? Okay, so what you got to do is Arm & Hammer baking soda. And uh, I'm not trying to promote it, but if you want to give, okay. So you get your Arm & Hammer. You make a fake volcano. What you do is you take it, take a tube, and you put a bunch of uh, baking soda in there. Then you put red food dye in there. And then what do you do? You pour what? Vinegar. And what happens? There's a chemical reaction, right? It starts to, starts to like effervesce and does that. And it comes over and it spills over. It looks like a volcano. And it does it for a period of maybe a minute or so. And then it calms down. And then the sequence stops. And then the water and the baking soda, again, separate from each other. Again, you pull it out, you see the separation. There's a chemical reaction. Okay, let me, let me give you an example. When Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, and rose again from the dead, there was a reaction, like a chemical reaction. And that reaction is people coming to know Jesus through what he's done on the cross. So for 2,000 years, this process, like that volcano is happening, for God, it might be five minutes for him to watch it. For us, it might be 2,000 years. But there's a process that's happening. Once the process stops, then he's going to come back. So I just want to help you understand that, that why is it taking, it's not taking as long as you think it's taking. In, in the natural, we have this. The Bible says that time will increase at the end. And so I, I've flown in airplanes and some of, some of you have as well. And suppose you're in an airplane, you're going about 455 miles per hour and you're flying, you're about 35,000 feet and now you're in a jet stream. Let's suppose the jet stream's 110 knots, whatever it is. And so now you're flying up almost 600 miles per hour or five near Mach 1. It would be Mach 1, but you're not in Mach 1. Why? Because you're on the air current. Your speed up there is only 400 miles an hour, but the ground speed is 600. And I do believe that what's happening is you and I are in the right time, but on the ground speed of history, we're going faster and faster and faster. And the prophetic clock is going quicker and quicker, even though the actual chronos of, the, of our watches are an hour or 60 seconds, like an airplane in the sky. And so what has happened is God is watching us unfold. And then when it stops, the end will come. See, but the Bible says in 2 Peter, he continues to say this, but the day of the Lord will come like a what? Thief in the night. Then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavens, heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, the earth's gonna be destroyed, all of it. Everything you build is gonna fall away. It's like building a sand castle in low tide and then the high tide comes in. It's all gonna be gone. It's all gonna burn. What sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness. Remember, there was a guy that used to tell us all the time, it's all gonna burn when your car breaks down. Don't worry about it, it's all gonna burn. It's easy for him to say he had nothing, okay? But it's all gonna go away eventually. Everything you see is temporary, right? So what kind of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for, and what does it say? Hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. Do you know that you can actually speed up the coming of the Lord? How? This gospel shall be preached to all ethnic groups and then the end will come. And so we're in the process of working with someone to translate the Bible in an unknown people group that don't have the language. And that is the gospel is going to all people. We can hasten the day by spreading the gospel. God is waiting for us to do our part. We can't make God come back, but we can speed up the process. How can I say that? What does it say here? Waiting for, and what? Hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. Because of which the heavens will be set on fire. Now, the apostle Peter, when he wrote this, there's no such thing as nuclear warheads. He never saw these things. He's describing things that are not even invented, right? Set on fire and dissolve, and the heaven bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth, which the righteous dwells. So God is going to basically destroy the heavens and the earth, reset, have a new heavens and a new earth. And the, all the showdown is going to take place in a place called Israel. Have you noticed people are trying to bring peace to the Middle East? And as hard as we try, we're not having success. There's going to come a world leader that's going to rise up. That's going to solve the problem according to what we can ascertain from scriptures. 
He's going to bring peace to the Middle East and all the trouble that's going on. You can see the, the interchange of cultures, of religion, ideologies, of governments, all are kind of happening right at that place. You can see right now, it's one of the greatest places of turmoil in the world and, and division. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, what? Be diligent to be found by him without spot, blemish, and the peace. Are you ready to meet God? Or is he going to show up at a time that you're not prepared for? I want to be ready. I want my life to count up for something. How about you, right? So what are some key signs? Remember, we talked about this. I want to reiterate what we talked about. It's almost like the birth pangs of a woman. You have the first trimester, the second trimester, and the third trimester. And as you get closer to the birth, the more contractions and the more violent the contractions, from what I understand, of course. I'm so glad. Man, aren't you glad we don't have to have babies? Right? Do you realize if men had babies, we wouldn't be here today? We'd be overrun with animals. There ain't no way. I'm, I get nervous when I have gas. Okay. That was unnecessary. But let's move on. So we're going to have false messiahs and prophets coming. A proliferation, more and more. We're going to see wars and rumors of war, more and more and more. As the time gets closer, more international conflicts, more natural disasters. You're going to see more and more, more contractions. You're going to see persecution of believers. In fact, in the last hundred years, there's been more persecution upon the church than all of the history beforehand, than all the 2,000 years. More people have died for their faith. And even right now, in places like Iran, places like North Korea, places in different places around the world, Christians are suffering. In America, we're not suffering that much, except if our Wi-Fi goes down. So we have persecution of believers. We have apostasy and lawlessness. So we see that going on, right? I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to redefine what it means to be a human being. I'm going to make fun of everything. I'm going to have, I mean, you see what's happening right now? A mockery of God's creation. Israel was stored, 1947, Israel was stored, a miracle. 1948, excuse me, 1948, Israel was stored. 1967, they recaptured Jerusalem. Check, check, check. All these check boxes are happening, right? Then we see this, the gospel to all nations. Now there's more. We can see the increasing of knowledge like never before. Daniel talks about this. He says, Daniel says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro across the earth, it says. And knowledge shall increase. Now, when it says knowledge shall increase in the Hebrew, what it means is an exponential increasing of knowledge. More and more and more and more knowledge will happen at a faster rate of speed. We see that happening today. My grandfather, Poppy, William Harcuff, was born in 1898. My dad's father was like born in 1887. So William Harcuff, born in 1898, grew up in Germany, and all they had was a horse and buggy. Horses. They had no cars. They had no airplanes. And so if you were to tell this father in your son's lifetime they're going to walk on the moon, you see, you're out of your cotton-picking mind. Ain't no way someone's going to walk on the moon. Give me a break. That's insane. How could that possibly be? Then in my grandfather's lifetime, they went from... They went from that to automobiles, to the Wright brothers, to jet airplanes, to rockets, to in 1969, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, which my grandfather did not believe. And some of you don't believe it either. But anyhow, that's beside the point. We're not going to get into conspiracy theories. And so it's unbelievable in this lifetime. But do you realize that time, knowledge is increasing at an amazing rate? I was just reading this the other day. Historically, human knowledge doubled approximately every century until 1900. So every 100 years, it would double. So we went from the bronze, the iron, and we went through all these different ages, right? We discovered gunpowder and all this. But pretty much the Romans in the 1700s, there wasn't much difference between the technology, if you think about it, right? We had a printing press, which was a huge... By the way, it was the Gutenberg press when we begin to have movable type that gave the ability to spread knowledge at a greater level, that's when technology took off. The Gutenberg Press was what began the process of going faster. So this is what happens, okay? Historically, human knowledge every 100 years. But by the end of World War II, knowledge is doubling every 25 years. Today, 
the average rate uh, of knowledge reproducing itself to a higher level is every 13 months, doubling its knowledge. The IBM predicts with the, exp with the advent of AI uh, that it could read, it could actually, knowledge can increase in some fields in every 12 hours. And how can that be? See, the advent of AI is pretty significant, what's taking place. You have nanotechnology, quantum computing, uh, all these types of things. And some things are going very, very fast. And so we're, we're even able now with, with these supercomputers, you see, the average human being has about three to four hours of peak productive time where you can probably spend about three hours a day and really focus and do a lot of good work. After that, you kind of shut down a little bit. You're not at the same peak performance including scientists and all them. We have to sleep half the time, right? Computers don't have to sleep. Artificial intelligence could go on and on and on. I was listening to Elon Musk and a few other people uh, reading about it and also listening to the podcast about it. And he's talking about AI. He was mentioning the fact that he's really concerned about it because what's happening is he just said the other day with Jordan Peterson in his podcast, and, and believe me, he has his own AI he's making, all right? So he knows what he's talking about. He says within 10 years, there's going to be more intelligence in AI than all the human minds put together at once. How can that be? It can happen. You know what happened according to, um, to, according to the book of Terminator. <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger, chapter 1, verse 2. <laughs> Skynet, right? We, we, that's like science fiction. The, the computers get so smart that they find that, that we're the virus. They want to get rid of humanity. And in fact, there are people even saying within the, the AI community, one guy quit because he says, I think that AI is almost sentient, which understands that it has its own process of thinking. And even people that are divine, uh, or have designed AI, or it's a bit of a mystery how it be able, it's able to learn and it educates itself more and it takes all the resources of the world. It's increasing all the time. We have chat GPT and a few other AI models and that's, that's like low grade. We have incredible computer technology now that through observation, they can tell your identity the way you walk, your voice imprint, your facial imprint, right? All the information is being gathered. It's incredible how intelligent these computers are getting now. And they're able, this AI and artificial intelligence can increase and it's doubling itself very quickly that within the next 10 years, it will be more intelligent than any human being could ever be. Right now, they say it's almost like a, a maybe a master's degree is kind of like where it's at. Not a PhD or multiple PhDs, but it's getting so smart and so intelligent that it constantly re, it constantly grows and grows and grows. The problem with artificial intelligence, of course, is the people who programmed it. It's flawed. So what does that mean? Well, it means a number of things which we'll share. I, I, it could very well be that in our time, in the near future, the cure for cancer will be found. Why? Because now we have these computations and calculations going on, trying all these simulations of how to, how to get cancer cells to stop multiplying and how to get rid of the bad ones. And all the, knowing the DNA, it can figure all this stuff out. It's got constantly doing these, these um, computations and calculations nonstop. So there's some good things that are going to happen, but there's also some bad things that can happen as well. The power of this. So, knowledge shall increase. We see it happening, right? M multiple travel. So we have gospel nations increasing knowledge, one world, and then also one world government. With the Bible talks about that. There's going to be one world totalitarian government. And you can see right now, for example, way back a century past, we used to have kings and queens in countries. That became kind of archaic. Then we got into a parliament and a democracy and, and voting. And that was all different. That was a much better system than the old monarchy, right? Well, now people are saying the country thing is outdated. We need to get rid of countries and borders and have a one world government. Why? Because we can share all the resources. There'll be no more hunger. Everyone will have a place to live. It sounds great. No more hunger. Everyone will have a place to live. Everyone will have health care, Right? And we'll distribute everything to everybody and everyone's going to be fine. Now, that, that was tried before by communism, by Karl Marx. And we saw how 20, 100 million people have died as a result of this kind of philosophy. Why? It sounds good on paper, but humanity doesn't have the capacity to deal with that kind of power. So a one world government is going to happen. 
And the Bible even talks about what's going to happen in the Middle East. There's going to be a lot of turmoil. God's going to, ra- I mean, God's going to allow an antichrist to rise up. He's going to be a smooth-talking politician who's going to actually solve the Middle East crisis problem, bring peace, get everyone to submit to their governments, and then they're going to turn the screws on people that are against what they're trying to accomplish, which can be you. In fact, there's even talk of a new world religion. We're going to create a new world religion, take all the attributes of all the religions and have AI and humanity come up with a new religion. And you better follow this religion because it's more evolved. That other stuff is is caveman stuff. We've evolved as a culture. We know better now the system of things. So we're going to have one world government. It's going to happen. You see it happening right now. And they're trying to get rid of currency, right? You want to be able to track everything you're doing. Then we also have the mark of the beast. What's the mark of the beast? What's that all about? Well, we're going to look at it right now. In the book of Revelation, it says this, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast. Now, what's, what is this all about? Well, one world government, increasing knowledge. This is the same passage of scripture. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. So the image speaks. What does that mean? The statue speaks. The statue becomes alive. Now, what is AI? What is robotics? Could it be? We used to make statues in the past, worship the statue. Now this statue can speak. This statue can tell you what to do. This statue is a lot smarter than all humanity put together, the AI. Could it be that? It's very likely it could very well be that way. And by the way, this this image of the beast might even be able to speak. There are people falling in love with artificial intelligence. They have these artificial intelligent girlfriends that they talk to in boyfriends, seriously. You think I'm making this stuff? I I wish I was making this. I'm not making this up. It's only a matter of time. Before, and by the way, the problem with the machines are it's, it, it looks like it's intelligent. It looks like it has a personality, but it's all, it's all simulated. So you can see what's happening, a reliance upon this for relationship. Okay, so people begin to worship this thing. You got to do what it says or else the image of the beast is going to know where you are, what you make, where you are, can predict what you're going to do. Again, this is not just science fiction. This is stuff that's happening in our world. And so if you don't worship the image of the beast, now check this out. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be what? Marked on the right hand or the forehead. Now, what the Jewish people used to do, they used to put phylacteries, and they used to put scripture on their hand and on their mind to represent that my hand is going to be controlled by the word of God. In other words, I'm going to do things that are appropriate and right that honor God. I'm going to think as God wants me to think. The mark of the beast is indicating this, that mind control. Okay, when a culture tries to redefine speech, if you you can redefine the language, you can redefine the culture and redefine how you think. So they want to control what you think and what you do. So the mark of the beast, is it literally a mark or not? Well, we do know some of you have the mark of the beast on your dogs, right? They put a chip on the dog in case they find the dog, they can find out where it's from. Well, we have the technology today. They can put a chip right in your your hand or your forehead. So, I mean, aren't you tired of losing your car car keys? Just walk up to the car. Welcome, welcome, Eric. Click, click. It opens up for me. Where do you want to go now, right? I just tell it where it wants to go. I want to buy something. I walk up. Oh, and he sees my hand, I, it, it, right? The hand's right there. I can buy, I can sell. Why? I have the mark of the beast. Now, what is the mark of the beast? What is it? Well, it's going to happen. Now, isn't it amazing when, they, when the apostle John was on the Isle of Patmos, how would he understand these types of things, right? How would every eye see and every ear hear about Jesus without multimedia and stuff like that, right? So here you have the situation. we be marked on the right hand of the forehead so that no one can what? Buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is the mark name of the beast, okay? So that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and its number is 666. Six represents the number of man, seven represents God. So 666, what does this mean? You have to submit 
to the, 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 the monetary system. You can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast. You have to sign off in what it says for you to do, or you cannot buy or sell. You're going to be on the streets without a job, without food. You're going to have to be like a beggar or a nomadic person unless you submit. This is what's coming, everybody. The Bible talks about it. We have the technology today. Now, what is the number of the beast? Well, I'm going to show you. Maybe some of you have never seen this before. Let's check this out. Now, the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was what? 666. What does that mean? Well, let me tell you. Solomon was one of, the, one of the wisest men that ever was. Extremely bright, intelligent, an amazing leader. The Bible says, and according to the Old Testament, he had two encounters with God. He had two visitations with God. He started off his, his kingship very, very good. The Queen of Sheba came to visit him, and everyone in the world came to see him. He was very, very, very wise and very wealthy. And the Bibles told him the kings should not acquire too much wealth or get horses from Egypt, or marry foreign women, and he did it all. He married a bunch of foreign women. He had a bunch of porcupines and concubines, okay? He married, why did he marry all these women? Because if you marry someone's daughter, you're not gonna go to work, war with them, right? It's part of peace. Then he started getting all this wealth, and he began to collect all this money. And how much did he collect in one year? 666, 666, which means what? He, the love of money is the root of all evil. And so the God of mammon, you cannot love God and money. You have to love one or the other. And what happened to Solomon was he became a fool because he worshiped money, 666. So what is the beast? The beast is the monetary buying and selling power we're going to have in the world. And unless you submit to that, you cannot participate in the economy of the world. It's very clear. That's what it is. So, there's a little problem here, everybody. We're addicted to money. Let's be honest, right? We, we're living way beyond where we're able to afford. We're paying money for, and look at our culture. We're so in debt. So what happens? We become indebted to the monetary. I got to pay this bill and this bill and this bill and the other bill. We have all these debts. Why? We want to have power. We want to have wealth. We want to have uh, money. We're worshiping money. We're worship Why is money? Money gives you options and gives you the illusion of control. So now I have more control because I have more money. The money is not a bad thing, by the way. The Bible says, for the love of money, not money itself. And so when you can't tithe, that's a good sign. Now, I'm not saying it's to raise money for the church. Please understand that. I'm telling you right now, there's a reason why God says tithe and give. Why? It breaks the stronghold of mammon upon your life. However, some pastors have been teaching this. You give 10% and God will give you a new house. Okay? Now it's all about getting, giving to get. Okay, giving to get is the spirit of mammon. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. You don't give to get, you give to give. And God will bless you. You see the difference? So one of the ways we get ourselves clean and clear of this is we don't let money control us. We kind of cut back and don't buy things we can't afford, right? And so this is one. And the problem is we have hooks in our mouth. And right now the enemy can go like this. And whatever he says, you got the hook of mammon in your mouth. Money controls people. They'll do anything for the dollar, right? And so right now, we have a bunch of mammon addicts in America and the world. So the Antichrist comes. You can't buy or sell without me. Boom, got everyone under slavery. You see that? It's like a pusher who goes in the street and hands out heroin to people gets them addicted, now they need to get their fix or they go into convulsions. You see, the love of money is the root of all evil. And this is what we have going on here. That's the mark of the beast. You wanna know what the mark of the beast is? It's the monetary system. So what do we do? Do we move to Wyoming, buy a thousand acres and put electric fences with diesel fuel and solar panels and guns? No. <laughs> Not a bad idea, right? cornerstone compound <laughs> and all the zombies come we'll take care of them all and they were unaware by Jesus okay this is what begins to happen okay and then Jesus talks about what's going to happen 
and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and one left. Two women will be grinding in the mill, one will be taken, one will um, be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not stay awake. No one's sleeping, all right? Okay, stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, let me just quickly go through this, all right? This is the basic basics. We've been going through it. We have Jesus. Once Jesus died, we entered into the end times. Okay, the end times, the first, second trimester. Then we come to the third trimester. That's called the great tribulation. What is tribulation? Great difficulty, okay? It's going to come to a cataclysmic uh, crescendo at this point in history. Where it's going to get so bad, all right? It's going to happen. The Antichrist comes. And, now, and then what's going to happen is Christ comes back. Then he comes, then he judges everyone. You go to heaven or to hell. Now, this is the end times uh, calendar. There are different views. Now, hang on for a second. Just hold on. I'm going to help you just for a few moments, okay? You guys with me? All right. So you have Jesus, you have the end times. So you have the um, end times. Then you have the tribulation. You have people that believe in pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation. Tribulation is when all hell is let loose upon the earth, the Antichrist and all that. Okay. Now in America today, we don't have much persecution, but in other parts of the world, they do. There are people that believe, and if I was a voting member of the Second Coming Committee of Heaven, I would vote pre-trib all day long. What's your vote? Pre-trib, because that's the one I want, okay? But what I want is not always what God's going to do. Have you noticed that? Okay. So you get the pre-trib, and what happens is this. They believe what's going to happen is the earth is going to be, the, the people on earth, Christians, are going to be um, raptured, and when, they're, when the Christians are gone, society falls into chaos, which opens the opportunity for the Antichrist. Okay, that's what they believe. The people mid-trib, what they believe is the Antichrist is going to come, difficulty is going to happen, and we're going to go through it partially, but once God releases his bowls of wrath, when God himself brings his calamities upon mankind, including uh, all kinds of issues such as fire and, and all that kind of stuff, then God's going to rapture us out at that point. And then there are others who believe that Christ comes back only once where he comes, we go through all this. And by the way, are you ready to meet God? I mean, and to, whatever you believe, what difference does it really make? God's going to do what he's going to do, right? But if you believe, that's why you should be willing to go through it all. And there are Christians who love Jesus and are, are wonderful that believe, are pre. There are wonderful Christians that believe in mid. There are wonderful people that believe in post. There are some folks, and then this is what begins to happen. Christ comes back. He sets up a millennium kingdom. It's only found in one chapter in the book of Revelation. It goes for a thousand years. And then there's a final battle. There are some people who don't believe in a millennial reign. They think right now we're a millennial, which simply means we're in the age of the church. Um, St. Augustine believed that. Some of the early church fathers believed that. Other church fathers believe in a pre-tribulation. In the 1830s, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the early church fathers believed in the um, Premillennialism. Now, in the 1830s, the pre-trib got more vogue. I don't have time to talk about it all right now. But the bottom line is, these are secondary. These are the main issues. You follow me, everybody? Okay? So, what does this all mean? Well, in Matthew 24, 32, this is what Jesus says. For as, it, as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days, before the flood, they were what? Eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. So what happened? Then the flood came. Now let me explain something to you. Noah built the ark. I know it's a song. But Noah built the ark, and it took him 100 years to build that ark, over 100 years. God was very patient. He was an evangelist. He was sharing that judgment is coming. And so 100 years is a long period of time. So what happened? Started with the design, then he started building it, then the ark was completed. Then the animals were there, right? That everything was set in place. Then the ark was built and everything was ready. When did the flood come? Did it come immediately? We do not know. Okay? And then everyone's living their life and then cataclysm came. Chaos. Now, think about this for a moment. What is happening in our culture right now is the ark is being built right now. 
The gospel shall be preached and then the end shall come. Check. The boat's pretty built, right? Israel becomes a nation. Boom. Jerusalem, right? We talk about knowledge increasing. So we see all these signs where the ark of God's second coming is being built. Now, how far along is it? Are we at the end of all things? I do not know. But my goodness, it's being built all around us. There's not too many prophecies left. So, as it is in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. I want you to focus up with me just a few more moments. I'm going to show you something you may have not have seen before. And it's found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 4. Now, just pay attention to this. We mentioned, remember, we mentioned the fact, as in the days of Noah, right? He built the ark. The ark was completed. And then were they surprised when it came? They didn't know when it was going to come, but it came. But they had an idea it was coming. You follow me? The rest of the world did not. But Noah had an, had an idea it was going to come. He was surprised when it came, but he wasn't shocked. Now, check this out. Thessalonians, Apostle Paul says the following. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers... You have no need to have anything written to you, except we do. For you yourself are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a what? Thief in the night. There's more I can say about that. While people are saying there is peace and security, like they were in Noah's time, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to what? Surprise you like a thief. What does that mean? It means the world is going to be surprised like a thief in the night. But for us, according to the word of God, that day to surprise you like a thief, you're going to know the signs are there. Like Noah and his boys, right? Like Noah and his um, sons-in-laws and daughters. He, the, the ark was built. We are not surprised. We see the signs of the times. The man of lawlessness will be revealed. These things will not happen until the man of lawlessness is, is revealed. So these things are going to happen. So we have an idea when God's going to come back. These things have to happen first. Then you know you're close to the end. So we are to be ready towards the end. So what does that mean? Are you ready to meet God? That's the bottom line. He's going to have to give an account. And the best thing is, whether we're raptured out or you die, we all should be ready to meet God at any moment, right? That's what the, the, the whole end times is about, being ready and not being caught off guard. Now, let me just say something to you. Just last week, we had a man in the back. His name is Chris Riker. I've known him for over 23 years, 22 years. He's one of the most faithful ushers you ever want to meet. There's a friend of mine. You might have known him. He's in the back. He'd come to three services. Sometimes he did all wonderful things. He would go hiking. I've been hiking with the guy. And I'm like, I can't keep up with him. I'm the guy who was in good shape. He was 72 years old. And he was here last week. Uh, after uh, Last week I said during the service, I know some people I've met that were here on Sunday. And the following week they're not. Eerily enough, he went home that evening. He cut his neighbor's lawn. He cut his own lawn and cut two or three other neighbors' lawns that were, in, that were elderly. He went to his office, and apparently he died. He died in his office, 72 years old. No indication he was here last week, and he, now he's gone. You don't know whether he's coming back for the rapture. You don't know if you're going to die. Are you ready to meet him? That's really the whole purpose of the end times, is to be about God's business, not waste our life. Be ready. In fact, last, yes, yesterday, last night, I was on the canal path, and I was exercising. And I was, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was actually rollerblading. I know it's kind of dorky, but I was rollerblading. <laughs> and I was keeping my heart right up to 120, 130. I was going for about an hour, right? I, I got back. I got up to 147 beats per minute, which is pretty high from someone. So I, I got off the, I started taking my skates off. I, I started feeling kind of sick. I'm like, whoa. And I couldn't catch my breath. And I felt like I thought I was going to pass out. And I felt I was going to throw up. I'm like, what is going on with me? And so I tried to call Sandra and went right write the voicemail. <laughs> when you're sent the voicemail, that's like the sign of hell, right? So I get sent the voicemail. I don't know what to do. And I, I, I was like, whoa, I never felt this. I think I'm going to pass out. So I called 911. And then, and then about three minutes after I felt better, the, the police came. It took my EKG. And I, I, for a moment there, I said, am I dying? Now, this is the weird thing. 
I felt like I might be dying. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I felt peace while I was in pain. I'm like, I know where I'm going. I want to be there for my kids. I want to be there for Sandra. I have arrangements for them because something would happen to me, but I want to be, I want to. And so I had peace in the middle of that suffering. And so, by the way, I'm fine. I, what, I overdid it, okay? I overdid it. So, um, but nevertheless, and so you never know when your last day is. Are you ready to meet God right now? If you were to come back right now, would you be ready? Or if you were to die, are you ready? That's the, really the question. Are you ready? Are you living a life worth, worth living? Are you making a difference in this day? Or are we all distracted with everything else. Let me ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes.